Hello, in this lecture we're going to be taking a look at first in, first out inventory method. We will be selling coffee mugs and we won't be specifically identifying the coffee mugs in this case as we've talked about in a prior lecture. This time we're going to be using a cost flow assumption, that cost flow assumption being the first in, first out assumption this time. To set up this problem in any cost flow assumption, I highly recommend putting together a worksheet. That worksheet including headers of purchases columns, then we got the cost of merchandise columns, then we have the ending inventory. I highly recommend setting up a worksheet like this, whether it's by hand or in a computer or in Excel, because it answers all the types of questions that could come up with an inventory cost flow type of assumption. Within those sections, we will then have the quantity and then the unit cost and the total cost. We're gonna have, if we sell something, we're calculating the cost of that sale. We're gonna same thing, we're gonna have the quantity, the unit cost and the total cost. And then the ending inventory, we're saying what is left. Again, we can represent that with the quantity, the unit cost. And then I have two costs uh, totals here because there's going to be different layers. So we're just, the first cost is going to be the cost per layer. The second cost, we're going to be adding up total layer. That'll make more sense as we go. We're going to start off here with inventory on the trial balance represented in terms of dollars of 5,000. Trial balance represented in terms of dollars. Remember that when we look at inventory, it's going to be represented in terms of units. And we're going to have to convert those units into dollars. So when we see it on the trial balance, we need to back that number up in a similar way that we needed to back up, say, the accounts receivable by customer. Who owes us that $44,900? In terms of inventory, what makes up that $5,000 worth of inventory? In this case, we're going to start off with 100 units times the $50. I know they're very expensive coffee mugs. They don't look like much, but 100 units times $50 and that's going to give us the 5,000. So that is the only layer, so that's going to be the total cost. That 5,000 represents the 5,000 on the trial balance. Let's take a look at some journal entries and see how we track this. First transaction will be the purchase of 400 more units at $55. In terms of units, that means, of course, we had 100 units. Now we purchased another 400 units, meaning we have 500 units. The journal entry is pretty straightforward because we paid for what we paid for. It's not, there's no estimate involved in the journal entry. That's the cash we paid. We paid 400 times $55. So we're gonna say inventory is going up with a debit of 22,000, 5,000 plus the debit of 22,000 brings inventory on our uh, trial balance up to $27,000 worth of inventory. And then we're gonna say we bought them on account. So the credit's gonna go to accounts payable we have 12,150. We're going to credit increase in accounts payable to 34,150. That's what we have at this point in time. Now, the challenge here, of course, is that we're going to have to back that number up. This 27,000 now needs to be backed up on our worksheet. Last time we left off with one layer of 100 units at $50. Now, of course, we've got that 100 units plus the 400 to the 500 units. What we're going to do is draw a line under the prior transaction. First, we're going to say that we have purchases. The purchases are going to be 400 units in the purchases column. We purchased them for $55. Note that that's a higher cost than they were before rising prices in this case. 400 times 55 gives us that 22,000. Then in terms of ending inventory, we now have two layers. We had some that cost $150 and some that cost 55. I want to have both those layers under this red line as of the point in time of the latest transaction this purchase. Therefore, I'm just going to bring this number down. I'm just going to bring these down here. 100 units at $50 gives us that 5,000. Then we're just going to bring these over here and say the second layer was 400 units at $55 for 22,000. So the 5,000 plus the 22,000 gives us the total cost of the 27,000. That dollar amount now is what is represented on our trial balance. We have that backed up. Now, of course, the question will be when we make a sale, which ones did we sell? Did we sell the cheap ones, the old ones at $50 or the more expensive newer ones at 55? Remember that the mug itself, completely the same. It's just the increase in price due to the time period in which we purchased it. Answer, when we look at FIFO, will be the old one. The first ones that we're in will be the first ones that we're out, in this case being the cheaper ones. But we are getting ahead of ourselves, so let's take a look at a sales transaction. We're going to say we sell 420 units at $85. There's two journal entries related to the sale. Remember that the first half of the journal entry is no different. We're not tracking the sales price. If they give us the sales price in a problem, it's common for us to think, well, what does that have to do with our cost sheet? 
nothing. I mean, we might have used the cost sheet to come up with the sales price, but the sales price is not what we are tracking. First half of the journal entry, nothing is different. We're going to take the 420 times the 85, and that's going to be our journal entry. In terms of the units, of course, we've got the 500 units minus the 420 gives us the 80 left. That's what we're going to have left. Transaction for the first half of the journal entry will be the debit of the 35.7, the 420 times the 85, uh, and that will be increasing the receivable, assuming we made the sale on account. So we're increasing the receivable, and the second half of it will be the revenue account because we're earning revenue at that point in time, crediting the revenue for the 420 times the 85, increasing the revenue. This journal entry often gets neglected when we're looking at the cost flow assumption because that's not where we're focusing in on, but we need to recognize that when we make a sale, that, that journal entry is still there. That's the journal entry we normally focus on when we make the sale. What we need to track now, of course, is the decrease in the inventory. We had 27,000 in the inventory. What's the cost of those 420 units that were sold? That's when we need to go to our worksheet and say, hmm, well, we have, we're gonna say these two layers, 100 units at 50, 400 units at 55. We sold 420 units, therefore we're going to be working in the cost of merchandise because that's what we're trying to calculate the cost of the goods sold here. And we're saying which ones did we sell first? Well, if we sold 420 units, we sold the old ones first under the first in first out, those being the units at $50. There's only 100 of them. We sold 420, therefore we're wiping out that entire 100 units. We sold 100 units at 50, that's the assumption that we are making. That's given us that 5,000. This layer wiped out. Then we have 400 units and we sold 420. So we're going to say the 420 minus the 100 that we took out of the prior layer means we have another 320 that are in the second layer. Those are at $55. 320 times 55 gives us the 17.6. So 5,000 plus 17.6, that's the cost of goods. A question could ask that, or they could be asking what's left in Indian inventory, which we would then have to calculate using our worksheet here. And we're going to say, well, there was 100 units on this layer. We sold all of them. 100 minus 100 means there's zero left. Therefore, zero times 50 is zero. Then we had 400 in the second layer. We sold 320 of them, leaving us with that 80. There's that 80. And those 80 that are left then are at that higher cost of 55. 80 times 55 is 4,400. The zero in the first layer and the 4,400 in the second layer gives us 4,400 that is left in ending inventory. So remember, we have two things here that are going on. The question could ask, what's the cost of goods sold? 22.6, that's the journal entry that we need to record, leaving us with what's left in ending inventory after we record that journal entry, which will be 4,400. Let's post the journal entry. So here's going to be our journal entry for the cost of goods side of this sales. And we're going to say that the inventory is going down by that 22.6 that we just calculated. And we're going to credit the inventory. So that's going to bring the inventory down to that 4,400. That's what's left. Cost of goods sold, the expense related to us using the inventory in order to help us generate revenue, 22,600. Bringing the cost of goods sold to that 22,600. There's the transaction. And we can see that that 4,400 now, of course, matches what is in our worksheet.